Section 8.8, .8, Power Series, Part 1. So in this section, we're going to look at infinite series of the form n equals 0 to infinity c sub n x minus a quantity to the n. Um, you'll notice the difference between this infinite series and all of the infinite series we've looked at thus far is the general term in our series can say it contains both n's and x's. And of course, all of the other infinite series, numerical infinite series we've dealt with before, each of the terms in that series always depended simply on n, on the index. Now, the value of this infinite series, or the values of the terms, depend on n and depend on x. So in that sense, it would definitely make sense to write that f of x equals this infinite series. And in that sense, if this infinite series converges, we can definitely see that the value of the sum will depend on the x that we pick. So for example, if I said that I was going to define a function via one of these infinite series, and let's say the infinite series looked like n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial, then when I vary that x value, for example, when x is 1, I'm going to get the numerical series n equals 0 to infinity 1 to the n over n factorial. And of course, I know that 1 to the n will just become a 1. However, if I were to evaluate this function at negative 2, that means I would end up with the infinite numerical series negative 2 to the n over n factorial, which is obviously a completely different infinite series than the one above it. And so I am generating different numerical series by varying this x value. So in that sense, this infinite series is definitely depending on this x value. So I really am let's say, defining a function of x via an infinite series because I've constructed an infinite series in which the terms depend on that x value. Okay, when I create an infinite series like this one that depends on x in this way, and when that infinite series has this particular form, we're going to call that a power series. So to be a little more explicit here, let's say that f of x equals the infinite series n equals 0 to infinity c sub n times x minus a to the n is called a power series. In the variable x, so a power series in x, centered at a, which is this value right here. And you'll see what I mean by centered in a minute and why I'm choosing that word. Uh, notice that if I create the series f of x equals n equals 0 to infinity c n x to the n, that that's really the same as this expression above except I've let a be 0. So I would say that this is a power series centered at 0. And of course, if you think about transformations, you know that if this was a function, I know that changing this x minus a to other x plus or minus b values would produce shifts. And so that might have something to do with the center of an interval of convergence, for example, if we were going to talk about where this series converges. And that's what we're going to get into next. All right, so we've defined what we mean by a so-called power series. And the next question is, if this power series is an infinite series, I'd want to know when it converges. All right, so let's look at a general power series centered at a, so again n equals 0 to infinity cn times x minus a to the n. 
um, it's going to turn out that the simplest way for us to try and figure out where this converges, and again, when I say where, I do mean for what values of x. does this series converge? And it's going to turn out that the, the go-to test and the one that works very well is the ratio test. And this is the test you're going to use for all these power series to determine this thing I just alluded to a minute ago, which is this so-called interval of convergence. So let's look at an example. Well, before we look at the example, let's just look at this in general. Um, in this particular sum, if I look at this guy, I could definitely call that a sub n. So let's say a sub n is c sub n times x minus a to the n, in which case this series I'm looking at is n equals 0 to infinity a sub n. And we know how to test for convergence or divergence using the ratio test. We're supposed to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. And then depending on whether that limit is less than 1 or greater than 1, we can determine if it's convergent or divergent. We know that we want this to be less than 1 to achieve convergence. All right, so if a sub n, if I'm viewing that as this entire thing, then to do the ratio test, what I should do is look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this entire expression where I evaluated n plus 1, which would be c n plus 1 times x minus a to the n plus 1, over this expression simply evaluated at n, which would be c sub n times x minus a to the n. Okay, now, right away I notice something nice. x minus a to the n plus 1 over x minus a to the n is just x minus a, which means I have limit n goes to infinity, and let's write it this way. Absolute value of c sub n plus 1 over c sub n times the absolute value of x minus a. Notice that x minus a doesn't have anything to do with n, which means as far as this limit is concerned, x minus a is a constant. Therefore, I can really factor that constant outside the limit so that I get absolute value of x minus a times limit n goes to infinity absolute value of c sub n plus 1 over c sub n. Okay, what do I want to happen? I want this limit to be less than 1. And if it is, the ratio test will guarantee me convergence. Okay, if the absolute value of x minus a times the limit n goes to infinity c sub n plus 1 over c sub n is less than 1, then of course that's the same thing as saying the absolute value of x minus a is less than 1 over the limit n goes to infinity, absolute value, c sub n plus 1 over c sub n. But of course, that's just the same thing as saying the absolute value of a is less than the limit as n goes to infinity of the reciprocal of this guy, which would be absolute value of c sub n over c sub n plus 1. All right, now, if this limit exists, if it exists, then what I've got is, and if we wanted to call that L just for a minute, we would have x minus a absolute value less than L, which I know is the same thing as x minus a is greater than negative L and less than L. And this limit would be positive if it existed, since the thing I'm taking the limit of here is positive. And if I just add a to all three parts, then I get a minus l is less than x is less than a plus l. And you'll notice there what I have then is an interval that's really centered at a, where the upper limit of that interval is a plus l, 
and the lower limit of that interval is A minus L. In other words, I am guaranteed convergence on the interval A minus L to A plus L. Uh, to put this a little more explicitly, what we're saying is if we have the series n equals 0 to infinity, c sub n x minus a to the n, this series will definitely converge on the interval a minus the limit n goes to infinity, absolute value cn over cn plus 1, to a plus limit n goes to infinity absolute value cn over cn plus 1. And of course, this is the thing here that I was just calling L a minute ago. All right, now, the ratio test will guarantee me that interval. And again, it is centered at A, and it's symmetric on both sides of it A with an A plus L and an A minus L. And so I am guaranteed on that interval that if I pick any x value and plug it into this formula, the resulting numerical series will converge. Now, notice the ratio test will only guarantee convergence within that open interval. Uh, the endpoints are another matter. Is it possible that a series such as this one could actually converge at the number x equals a minus l, or at the number x equals a plus l? And the answer is yes, it could. The ratio test only guarantees me open interval convergence. Okay, for example, uh, let's take something like the infinite series n equals, um, let's say, 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n, x to the n, over n times 3 to the n. Uh, you may notice that I've slipped something in there on you. I didn't start this lower index value at 0. I started it at 1. We know that shouldn't have anything to do with convergence. We know it's the tail of an infinite series that determines convergence. So whether the lower index value starts at 0 or 1 or 2 or 59, is not really going to affect the convergence question. So I have no problem starting my series at 1. Notice this is a power series. That is, it does look like a summation. There is a power of x. Notice that this would be centered at 0. I know that because it doesn't look like x minus 5 to the n or x plus 3 to the n. It just looks like x to the n. That alone tells me that the center is 0. And then what's the rest of the series? It's this negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n over n times 3 to the n. In other words, I'm viewing this part as the so-called c sub n, which means this does really look like infinite series n equals 1 to infinity c sub n x to the n. Definitely power series form. Okay, how should I test for convergence or try to determine the interval of convergence that we just talked about up here? I'll do the limit as n goes to infinity of, let's say, a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. I'm going to use the ratio test. And so, of course, what do I mean by a sub n plus 1? I mean, we're going to take this guy, our general term, and substitute n plus 1 for every n value that I see, which means I should have negative 1 to the n plus 2. That would be coming from right there. Times 2 to the n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1. And again, that's coming from evaluating that n at n plus 1. Same thing in the denominator. Let's replace both of those n's by n plus 1's. And I'll get n plus 1 quantity times 3 to the n plus 1. 
then I'm going to divide all of that by a sub n, which is really just this guy itself. But I know that just means multiplying by the reciprocal of that, which means I'm going to have times n times 3 to the n over negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n times x to the n. And of course, when you do these ratio tests with these power series, a lot of nice things usually happen. In fact, right out of the gate, I know that these negative 1 to n plus 2 and negative 1 to n plus 1 factors disappear because we're inside a big absolute value. Okay, what else disappears? Well, I know that these two make an x. So I could say this is equal to absolute value of x times limit n goes to infinity of... Okay, what else is left? Looks like there's 2 to the n plus 1 and there's 2 to the n. When I divide those two, that'll make a 2 in the top. Um, when I divide the 3 to the n and the 3 to the n plus 1, that'll make a 3 in the bottom. Okay, what's left? The only thing that's left is the n and the n plus 1. So the top becomes 2n, the bottom will become 3n plus 3. Uh, since n is greater than or equal to 1, I know those absolute values aren't needed anymore. So I'm really just looking at absolute value of x times limit n goes to infinity of 2n over 3n plus 3. I know that this limit is 2 thirds. So that means my ratio test limit is equal to absolute value of x times 2 thirds. Okay, again, the game here is to make that limit less than 1. So basically I'm going to set the result of this limit less than 1 and then solve for x. And if I do that, of course, what I get immediately is that the absolute value of x is less than 3 halves. Okay, again, what does that tell me immediately? It tells me that on an interval centered at 0 that's open from negative 3 halves to positive 3 halves, I am guaranteed that this infinite series converges. So it will converge at values like 1, negative 1, 3 quarters, negative 5 6, 0. It will converge at all those values. It will definitely diverge at any numbers outside that interval. The only remaining question is, does it actually converge or diverge at the endpoints of this open interval themselves? Okay, for that, we're going to look at each one of those cases separately. And this is pretty easy to do. Again, what was our series? It was n equals 1 to infinity, um, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n, x to the n, over n times... 3 to the n. And the question is, numerically, what does this series do when x is equal to negative 3 halves or when x is equal to positive 3 halves? Well, when x is equal to negative 3 halves, our series becomes n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n times negative 3 halves to the n over n times 3 to the n. And of course, right here is where I'm evaluating this power series at x equals negative 3 halves. Okay, if I do that, notice that is the same thing as n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 2 to the n times negative 1 to the n times 3 to the n over 2 to the n. And basically what I'm doing there is taking negative 3 halves to the n and just noticing that that's really comprised of these parts. And it's always going to be much easier usually for me to break something like that up into the constituent parts.
Okay, automatically something strange happens here. Since I already had another power of negative 1, when I multiply those two together, I know that I should add the exponents, which means when I combine those two parts, I'm going to get negative 1 to the 2n plus 1. Notice what else happens. The 2 to the n's cancel, the 3 to the n's cancel. And the only other thing that's left is this n down in the bottom. Okay, now, for any positive integer n, what can I say about 2n plus 1? That's always going to be an odd integer. Okay, if I take negative 1 and raise it to any odd power, I'm always going to get negative 1. So that means for all values of n, this guy right here is actually just negative 1. Okay, I recognize immediately that that's just the negative of the infinite series n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n, which I recognize is the divergent harmonic series. Okay, this tells us what? When x is equal to negative 3 halves, our power series diverges. Okay, what about x equals 3 halves? Well, for that, the only thing that would change is our negative right here. The negative from that negative 3 halves will not be there. That means that negative 1 to the n won't be there. That means this negative 1 to the 2n plus 1 should just still be this negative 1 to the n plus 1. And everything else stays the same, so that means we're looking at the series n equals 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n. And I recognize by the alternating series test that that's convergent. Okay, so that means when x equals 3 halves, we're convergent. Okay, put this all just together, and that says what? Our infinite series, or our power series we started with, has an interval of convergence that's open from negative 3 halves to 3 halves, but now we've shown that when x equals negative 3 halves, we are definitely divergent, but when x equals 3 halves itself, this numerical series is actually convergent. Okay, that means this now is our complete interval of convergence for this series. If we pick any x values in that interval and evaluate this infinite series at those x values, that series will converge. So this is the so-called interval of convergence. And it's the one where we've actually checked the two endpoints individually to see what sort of individual numerical infinite series they yield. All right, I'm going to make a summary statement here in a minute about intervals of convergence, but before we do, let's look at two more examples to sort of uh, lead us in the right direction. So let's look at the example of n equals 0 to infinity x to the n over n factorial. And again, just for some practice here, let's run the ratio test to see if we can determine the open interval of convergence. So I would take the limit as n goes to infinity of my basic term with n switched out for n plus 1. That would be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial divided by the basic expression with just n's, which would be multiplying by the reciprocal, so n factorial over x to the n. Again, we know that x to the n plus 1 divided by x to the n is going to give us a, a difference of powers of 1 there, which means I get absolute value of x, which I can pull outside the limit, and what remains for the limit is n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. And I've drop the absolute values because I don't need those anymore. Uh, what's that equal to? Absolute value of x times what's the limit as n goes to infinity of n factorial over n plus 1 factorial? Well I recognize that when I divide n factorial by n plus 1 factorial what I get 
is 1 over n plus 1. Okay, what is this limit? And I should recognize that that limit is 0, which means this is absolute value of x times 0, which notice, regardless of what x is, that's always going to be equal to 0, no matter what x value I pick. And that is always less than 1. Therefore, we're saying the limit as n goes to infinity of our basic a sub n plus 1 over a sub n for this power series is less than 1 for all x. Because at this point, the value of x didn't make any difference. This limit was going to be 0 anyway, which would automatically be less than 1. Therefore, I can say this series converges for all x. So the so-called interval of convergence is negative infinity to infinity. It's still an interval, it's just everything. Okay, let's do one last example. Let's look at the infinite series n equals 0 to infinity n factorial times x to the n. So instead of dividing, let's multiply. Well, of course, we, we have a guess about what's going to happen here. If dividing by n factorial was making this guy decay so quickly that it converged, I suspect that if I change it to a multiplication, I'm probably going to produce a lot of divergence. Okay, exactly how much? Well, again, if I run the ratio test, I'll do limit as n goes to infinity. Uh, what would it be? n plus 1 factorial over x to the n plus 1 divided by n factorial times x to the n. I'm still going to get that lone factor of absolute value of x to come out. What's left inside is limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1. All right, now, is this limit, which is equal to this, ever going to be less than 1? Is that possible? Well, I know this limit is infinity. So regardless of what this x is, there's no way that I'm going to produce a product here that's less than 1. So the ratio test says that for no x, is this limit going to be less than 1? Well, almost. You should notice that there is one value of x that actually would make this limit less than 1. And in fact, it is x equals 0 itself. Now, just to uh, do a little conjecture here, do we agree that if that x factor was something like an x minus 2 instead of an x, that the value of x that would again cause convergence here or satisfy the ratio test would be x equals 2 because that's the value that would make this factor 0. Okay, that would be true if our series, our power series, was centered at 2. All right, in our example, it was centered at 0. So there was an absolute value of x here. And what we're saying is this series will converge at no real values of x other than the center, other than at x equals 0. So this series converges only at x equals 0. So there is no proper interval of convergence. There's just simply a single value at which this series converges, and it is the center itself. All right, so now that we've run through these three examples, let's sort of summarize what happened in those three examples. In the first one, the open interval we got from running the ratio test was negative 3 halves to 3 halves. In the next one, we got negative infinity to infinity. And in the last one, we got only the single value x equals 0. Okay, in this first one, 
the center was zero and the interval extends from negative three halves to three halves which is definitely an open interval centered at zero and it would actually make sense perhaps to say that the radius of that interval is three halves because that's half of the width of that interval so in this case I'm going to say the radius of convergence and we're coining a phrase there is r equals positive three halves and I'm always going to take this radius of convergence to be a non-negative number and so what we're saying here is if we have an actual open interval of convergence guaranteed by the ratio test and it's some finite open interval centered at a then the radius will be that value that gets me half of the width if you like of that interval so what's the radius of convergence of this interval well it would make sense to say that r equals infinity what would it make sense for this one well there's no interval well how do you have something that looks like an interval centered at a that goes from a minus r to a plus r uh, the only way you could do that is to shrink that value of r all the way down to zero and if you did that the only thing that's left would be the center itself so in the case of convergence at only the center at only that one value in that case we'll say that r is equal to zero so if we have a power series let's say centered at A there are three possibilities number one there is some R greater than zero R finite which means this power series converges on an interval centered at R or centered at A with a radius of R which means we go R to the left and R to the right and that means the interval of convergence would be a minus r to a plus r the second possibility is r is infinity and that one's easy that just means this power series converges for all real x the third case is r is zero and that just means that this converges for only the center value and that makes sense you can see that if x equals a then this guy right here is zero and then this just becomes the sum of an infinite number of zero terms and that definitely converges to zero the one takeaway that uh, all have in common is we can definitely say all power series converge at the center whatever the center is for that series Okay, before we move on to the next part, we've got two little theorems to list here. And they're easy to visualize. We don't need to do formal proofs of these. Um, the first one says if we have a power series and let's say that power series converges at the number x equals b then the series is absolutely convergent at all values of x for which the absolute value of x minus a is less than the absolute value of b minus a and that's one of those statements that at first leaves you a little cold about what it's actually saying but if we draw a picture it's it's very simple what it's saying so first of all if we said a was the center of this series and then we suppose that there was some number b at which we also knew maybe just by trial and error by testing that at that value this power series also converged 
um, and it could be to the left or the right of A. Let's just uh, put it over here somewhere. Okay, so let's say we know the center is A, and let's say we know it converges at B. If we run the ratio test to try and figure out what the basic open interval of convergence is, it should be clear that the interval could not look like this. If I knew all the x values at which this series converged were inside that open interval, then I couldn't possibly converge at some value outside that interval. So that means this scenario is not possible, uh, but of course this scenario is possible. There could be some open interval like that centered at A where that B is simply a number inside that interval. So it's one of these two cases, and of course the open interval of convergence would have to contain the B if I had tested it at B and found it to be convergent. And actually my symmetry doesn't look very good. Now it's even worse. How about, how about that? Now by the way, what is this distance right here? It's B minus A. Okay, if I know there is some symmetric open interval of convergence, and I have tested at B and found the series to be convergent at that B, then if I move to the other side of A by this same distance of B minus A, I would expect the series to also be convergent at that value. And if all of these values are inside this larger interval of convergence, then that means this series must converge everywhere in between these two numbers. And obviously we're talking about B on the right. What's this value over here on the left? Well, it would be A take away this radius of convergence, which would be A minus B plus A, which would be 2A minus B. So basically, what is this theorem saying? It's saying if the center is A, and I've tested this series and found it to be convergent at B, then it must also be convergent inside the interval that's symmetric around A with a radius of B minus A, which means the other end of this minimum open interval of convergence that I'm guaranteed would be 2A minus B. In other words, I am guaranteed convergence on the interval 2A minus B to B. In other words, I'm guaranteed convergence if x is between 2a minus b and b. Of course, that's the same thing as saying what? If I subtract a from all three parts, I'd have a minus b is less than x minus a is less than b minus a. That's the same thing as saying the absolute value of x minus a is less than the absolute value of b minus a which is the statement I made here in the theorem. So to say it in reverse, what this inequality up here actually says is again, if I know the center and I've tested at some other number and found myself to be convergent there, then I can automatically create an interval whose radius is the distance from A to B and I will automatically have an entire open interval on which I know this series is convergent. That is for all of these values in between those two numbers. All right, now I said there was two theorems and I'll just quickly say what the other theorem is because it's just the flip version of this, which is if this series diverges at x equals b, then it also diverges at all values of x for which the absolute value of x minus a is greater than the absolute value of b minus a, which just says what? If I know the series converges or diverges at B, then it's going to diverge everywhere beyond that. 
it can't converge at any of these values out here. If it did, that means the upper limit or upper bound of my interval of convergence would have to be up here somewhere. But that means it couldn't converge at B because that would be inside that interval of convergence. Well, if it diverges out here, it's going to divide, diverge symmetrically on the other side. And that's what this inequality says. And notice that is really just the flipped version of the one we had up here. So this theorem is not in your book, but it's a pretty powerful theorem. It actually allows you to test a power series at a single value. And based on what you get for a result, you can automatically construct an interval. It may not be the final open interval of convergence that you would get if you did the ratio test, but it gives you a quick one uh, that oftentimes might be sufficient for what you're doing with these things. All right, now that brings us to the part of the lecture that I'll call uh, doing things with power series. And we're going to continue this in the second lecture, the next video. Uh, so we'll just say these are the, uh, the list of basic things, the basic rules for what we can do with power series and how it affects convergence. And then in the next video, we're going to do a lot of examples of how to use these particular tools to uh, really do some more interesting things with power series. Okay, now, first theorem. As usual in calculus, once we've defined a new function and we've gotten a, a sense of its meaning, uh, what's the list of things that we usually try and stack on top of that? We start talking about limits, and then from there we immediately proceed to how do we take derivatives, how do we take antiderivatives. So if a power series is really a function that I'm just defining with this infinite series formula, then of course the, the first thing I would ask is how do I take a derivative? And actually if I wrote out a few terms of this series, notice what you would get. And we haven't actually done this yet uh, from the formula, but notice it, it may be useful a lot of times for me to actually write out the first three or four or five terms in a power series. And I can see from this formula that if I generate the terms for n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, when n is 0, I'm going to get c sub 0 times x minus a to the 0. I know this part would be 1 since I'm raising to the 0 power. So let's just say that would be c0 times 1 plus c1 times x minus a to the 1 plus c2 times x minus a squared plus c3 times x minus a cubed and so on. And when you write it out that way, you really start to get the sense that what we're talking about here might aptly be described as infinite polynomials. Polynomials that have infinitely many terms with no limit to the degree. Obviously, as I generate more and more terms in this series, I'm just going to keep making the degrees of the terms bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, in fact, it might make sense even to call these C values the coefficients. And so if I took the basic series, c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared plus c3x cubed plus so on, you really might think of that as being an infinite polynomial where the c sub n numbers are the coefficients. And there is a term for every degree starting at degree 0 all the way up to whatever degree I want to choose. And then really, when I evaluate one of these power series at x minus a, it is a shifting. There is really just a, a simple transformation there. All right, now, if I were to ask you, how would you take the derivative of this? Well, I know how to take derivatives of polynomials. I know constant terms would disappear. I know for this part, the chain rule would say that I have c1 times x minus a to the 0, so that would just be c1. I would have 2c2 x minus a to the first. I would have 3c3 x minus a squared plus dot 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 dot. Okay, which means really what I'm doing is just taking the derivative term by term for an infinite number of terms. 
And if you look at the pattern and what you're doing there, uh, you really are just doing the power rule. And what I mean is, in our general formula up here, you're taking the n, you are pulling it down in front the way you always do, and then this power becomes n minus 1. All right, so if you look at the pattern and what we just did on this line, I think you'll agree that if the derivative is going to exist, the definition that would make sense would be c sub n times n times x minus a to the n minus 1. And that's really where I'm just thinking the derivative of something like a c sub n x minus a to the n, well, the derivative with respect to x should just be n c n x minus a to the n minus 1. And what this theorem is going to say, when I write it up here in a second, is that this is precisely the derivative of this function. In other words, we're going to take the derivative precisely the way we expect it would be taken. And it's going to turn out that when we take the derivative, the basic open and interval of convergence of the original series does not change. So let me go ahead and actually write the theorem now. Magic eraser has erased. So suppose f of x equals n equals 0 to infinity cn x minus a to the n converges with radius of convergence r, where r is some positive value. Uh, could also be 0 itself, and of course then we don't have a very interesting function. Our function is just 0 at that point. So let's at least assume here we have something where we have a positive radius of convergence. Then f prime of x is defined on the interval a minus r to a plus r. And notice that's just the interval of convergence of the original series. That's what's implied by saying that. I'll just pencil that up here. We are saying that the original series combines or converges at least on that open interval. Then we're saying the derivative will also be defined on that same interval. And we're saying f prime of x is calculated the way we think it should be, which is we pull the n down and we subtract 1 from the power. And there is a custom here. It's not essential or absolutely necessary, but it is customary when we take the derivative to re-index or to reset this lower index value to a value that makes this term non-zero. And what I mean by that is for this example, when I pull this n down, notice that if n is equal to 0, like it started out being in the original series, this term is actually 0, which is not very interesting. There's nothing there. So it's customary usually just to change that lower index equation to start it at the first index value that makes the general term in the series non-zero which means if I pull an n down, I would reset this to n equals 1. And so this theorem says if I have a power series convergent on some open interval, then the derivative is defined on that same interval and converges on that interval, and it is defined by this formula. And I'll just, uh, just for emphasis here, say that this converges on a minus r to a plus r. Um, I'll just say similarly, this idea can be extended to take more derivatives. So for example, what would the second derivative be? It would be the derivative of this guy, which means now I would pull down the n minus 1, which means I would have n times n minus 1 times c sub n x minus a to the n minus 2, and notice it would make sense to reset that lower index starting value there to be n equals 2, 
because if n is equal to 0 or n is equal to 1, these two factors will make this entire thing 0. Again, it's, it's just redundant if you leave it starting at 0. It's not wrong. It's just the custom to re-index that lower value when you're taking derivatives. All right, so the formula for taking the derivatives of power series is very simple. Uh, what the theorem is really guaranteeing is that this is how the derivative works and that when you do it, you are still guaranteed convergence on that same basic open interval that was the interval of convergence for the original series. Um, I'll dispense with the proof of this other than to say it's another application of the ratio test. Uh, I will make a note though, and you'll see this shortly here in some examples. Um, suppose the interval of convergence, and this is an example for a series, is let's say, um, let's say it's 3 to 11, and let's say it's open at 3 and close at 11, and let's say the one that we're talking about is an interval that goes from 3 to 11 and is centered at 7 so that of course we're saying the radius is 4. Okay so if f of x has an interval of convergence that looks like this the only and this is an important point to notice it's perhaps not made explicitly clear in the book the only thing we're guaranteed about the convergence of the term by term derivative is that it converges on the open interval 3 to 11. Okay, so let me make that clear. This theorem is saying that if I'm open, if I'm converging on this interval, I will be guaranteed to be convergent for the derivative on that same open interval. The original interval of convergence we know could contain one or both of its endpoints. And this theorem only guarantees, uh, even if the original series converges at one or both of its endpoints, this theorem only guarantees convergence on the open interval. Now, it may still converge at 3 and 11. So if the original series converges 3 to 11, open at 3, close at 11, uh, the derivative itself, I'm guaranteed 3 to 11 open, um, but I could still converge 3 to 11 closed. It may not change at all. But if you see what I mean here, the theorem only guarantees open interval convergence. Again, how would I figure out what's happening at the endpoints? I'd have to test those individually. And I'll do an example of that for you here in a minute. Okay, let's put these last three rules under the heading of composition and algebraic combinations. And it's a theorem where we're going to say theorem, suppose, as usual, f of x is a power series. And for convenience here, to, to make this show up a little more clearly to you, let's make this a power series centered at zero. So suppose I have the power series uh, Cn x to the n with radius of convergence r. Then number one, we're going to say something about what happens when we construct the function f of kx, which you can see is just a composition function. And then there's two others that we're going to look at. But before I route out the formula, let's, let's think about the f of kx here. And maybe we can sketch out what's going to happen. All right, so let's look at the ratio test for this series. And let's think about what f of kx is going to look like. So what's f of kx? It's n equals 0 to infinity. What am I doing? I am replacing, and actually I guess I don't want shading here what we're doing is replacing x by kx. 
which means inside my series this becomes c sub n kx to the n, which would be the infinite series n equals 0 to infinity c sub n k to the n x to the n. So if I do my ratio test on this series, I'm going to do the limit as n goes to infinity of c sub n plus 1 k to the n plus 1 x to the n plus 1 all of that over cn k to the n plus 1 or k to the n x to the n and of course as usual I know that these two are going to make a factor of absolute value of x that I can take outside the limit um, also I get these two which will make a k inside the absolute value. When I factor that out, that's going to give me an absolute value of k. And then what's left is the limit as n goes to infinity of c sub n plus 1 over c sub n. And again, uh, we know how we get the radius of convergence when we normally do the, the ratio test. In fact, what's the only thing that would be missing here in this ratio test if that k wasn't there, it would be this k. That's the only thing that would be missing. And if you look at what's left, that would be the absolute value of x times the limit n goes to infinity of the c sub n plus 1 over the c sub n in absolute value. And we walked through this before. We figured out that that had to be less than 1, which means the absolute value of x had to be less than the limit n goes to infinity of the c sub n over c sub n plus 1 absolute value. And this really became our r. That is our radius of convergence. Okay, what's the only difference now? Now there's this factor of k in there, which means you have a k absolute value times x absolute value less than r. Well, what's x going to have to be then? It's going to have to be less than r over the absolute value of k. All right, so what does this say? It says if I do an algebraic composition like f of kx and create this new power series, what's the interval of convergence going to look like? Well, instead of negative r to r, which was the original interval of convergence for this power series centered at 0, now it would be negative r over absolute value of k to r over absolute value of k. In other words, I'm going to have to divide r by the absolute value of k to compensate for this composition that I'm doing. That's the change that's going to affect or take an effect on the radius of convergence. So let's write that here. I'll just say, in fact, I'll write all this part again. I'll say f of kx, which equals n equals 0 to infinity, c sub n, k to the n, x to the n, will also converge on the interval negative r over absolute value of k to r over absolute value of k. In other words, let's say i.e. the radius of convergence is now changed to r over absolute value of k. And that makes sense. If I do some sort of algebraic composition it should have some effect on the interval of convergence. And of course, we could do complicated combinations to get more complex compositions, but we're trying to come up with some simple rules for you know, that 99% of the situations we're actually going to deal with. And one of the simplest is simply changing x to a multiple of x. And this part of the theorem says when we do that and create this new series, this is the new interval of convergence. Okay, so for example, what we're saying is if we knew, I'll just say for example, if we knew that the interval of convergence 
for a series, for a power series centered at zero, is, let's say, oh, I don't know, uh, let's say one to seven, i.e., actually I said centered at zero, didn't I? So I guess I need to do it centered at zero. How about negative five to five? And we construct f of 3x, the new interval of convergence, will be negative 5 thirds to 5 thirds. In other words, it will contract that interval of convergence. Okay, if that makes sense to you, and of course, this is not even necessarily something you have to memorize, I can obviously get to this interval of convergence every time by just running the ratio test. And in fact, you'll see when you look in the book, this is not listed as a theorem and it doesn't actually lay out for you uh, this explicit formula for what the new radius of convergence will be because the author is normally expecting you to just run the ratio test with, with the actual numbers you see in the problem every time. So that's what I'll do here for the last two parts, and I'll just say the other two that we're talking about or that are interested in, well, the next one would be taking a power of x. So instead of a multiple of x, we'll take a power of x. What would that give me? It would give me the series n equals 0 to infinity, uh, c sub n, x to the k to the n. I'll leave it for you to verify that if the original radius of convergence is r for the original series, that the new radius of convergence for this modified series will be the kth root of r. And this will also actually apply this formula if k is negative. Number three in the last one, suppose f of x is the series n equals 0 to infinity, let's say a sub n, x to the n. And let's say g of x, let's put that down here. Let's suppose g of x is the series n equals 0 to infinity, b sub n, x to the n. Then another natural combination we could ask about would be simple algebraic addition as in what happens when I take f of x plus or minus g of x, then of course I would add these two infinite series. So I'd have n equals 0 to infinity a sub n x to the n plus n equals 0 to infinity b sub n x to the n. And if these two converge, then we already had a theorem in an earlier section that said I can add these two infinite series and the resulting infinite series should also converge as long as these two converge. And the series I would get when I combine those, well, if I add these two parts and combine like terms, then what I'll get is a sub n plus or minus b sub n x to the n. In other words, this becomes my new coefficient for this addition or subtraction power series. Okay, where will I be guaranteed convergence? Uh, let me say that on the next page. If, well, let's just say it this way. The interval of convergence for f of x plus or minus g of x will be the intersection. of the intervals of convergence for the two series. In the case of two series that are both centered at zero, that's simply saying what? If I had one series that converged on the interval, let's say negative five to five, and I had another series that converged on the interval negative three to three, and I added those two series together, well, it's not too much of a stretch. It seems pretty plausible uh, 
that if I'm going to add those two series, um, this one over here does not converge in all the same places this one does. In particular, if I'm in between negative 5 and negative 3, or I'm between 3 and 5, then this series over here does not converge. That means if I expect to add these two series and get a convergent sum, I need to be sure that both of the two things I'm adding converge. Well, that means I just need to pick the largest interval on which they both converge. Well, if one of them converges on negative 3 to 3, and the other one converges on negative 5 to 5, one of those intervals, of course, is this one, and the other interval is this one. And the intersection of those two, of course, is everything between negative 3 and 3, because that's the only interval or set of numbers on which I'm sure both of these converge. And I need to be sure both converge if I'm going to try and add them together and form one sum series. All right, so this rule is pretty simple. If I'm going to add or subtract two power series, I'll just take the intersections of the intervals of convergence for the two series, and on that intersection, I'll be guaranteed convergence for the sum. All right, now, I've gone through those real quickly, and this is basically going to be the first video. The second video will do a lot of applications of these various uh, theorems and rules and tricks, uh, but let's close this video out with an example just to show us uh, how the differentiation rule works. Uh, so for example, let's look at f of x equals n equals 0 to infinity x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared. And so what I want to ask is, what's the derivative? Well, I know the derivative should be infinite sum and again, what do I do? Just regular power rule. I pull that n plus 1 down. That power reduces to n. Um, I did tell you that it's common to restart that lower index value, but in this case, you notice that when n is equal to 0, I actually do get a non-zero term here. So in this case, I need to keep this lower index value starting at 0. So there's my derivative. And I know that this will converge on at least the same open interval as the original series, which means what I want to do now is go back and look at this original series and figure out what its interval of convergence is. So back to the same routine. I do the ratio test and I look at the limit as n goes to infinity of absolute value x to the n plus 2 over n plus 2 squared times the reciprocal of this, which would be n plus 1 squared over x to the n plus 1. I can see that I'm going to get a factor of absolute value of x to come out times limit, n goes to infinity, all the remaining factors are positive, so I'll just drop the absolute value. It'll be n plus 1 squared over n plus 2 squared. Uh, when I take that limit, I know that limit is 1, which means this entire limit from the ratio test is absolute value of x. I would like that to be less than 1 which means we're talking about a basic open interval of convergence that goes from negative 1 to 1. Okay, what comes next when you're finding intervals of convergence? I check the endpoints. So that means I need to go back and ask what's happening when x is equal to negative 1. What happens when x equals 1? When x equals negative 1, if I look at my original series, which is right here, Let's see, what do I get? I get n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared, which I recognize is just n equals 0 to infinity, uh, negative 1 to the n plus 1 times 1 over n plus 1 squared.
and I don't have to think very long to realize that this creates alternating terms. And if I look at the other part, the 1 over n plus 1 squared, that's definitely positive, has a zero limit as n goes to infinity, and forms a decreasing sequence. Therefore, by the alternating series test, I know that this series is convergent. Okay, what about when x equals 1? When x equals 1, I have n equals 0 to infinity, 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 squared. That's n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n plus 1 squared. Uh, you could simply quote direct or limit comparison with the series, I'll just say by direct or limit comparison with the series n equals 1 to infinity 1 over n squared, I know that this series also converges. Okay, therefore, my series converges at negative 1 and it converges at 1. The interval of convergence for this series is the closed interval negative 1 to 1. Now, what did my theorem about derivatives say? It said that when I took the derivative, I'd be guaranteed convergence on at least the open interval, but I don't know for sure about the endpoints. Okay, so that means for the derivative, which was this guy right here, to figure out what's happening at those endpoints, I'm going to have to check those individually. Now let's uh, carry this derivative over to the next page. And by the way, if you notice, I, I just pointed to the wrong thing there. The derivative is here. I do notice that that n plus 1 cancels out with one of these n plus 1s in the bottom. So what I'm going to get from my series there for the derivative is x to the n over n plus 1. So x to the n over n plus 1. Okay, so we know the drill by now. We know that at least on that open interval we're good to go. We just need to check the endpoints. And you can see how this is going now. When we substitute those particular values of x, we're always going to end up referring to some basic series, either through direct comparison, limit comparison, alternating series test, geometric series, or one of those types usually. In the case of this one, when x is equal to negative 1, I get the series n equals 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the n over n plus 1, which is convergent alternating series. When x equals 1, I get n equals 0 to infinity, 1 to the n, which is just 1, over n plus 1, which you'll notice is divergent, and I get that by, again, the simplest way would be direct or limit comparison with the convergent harmonic series. Okay, so what is our interval of convergence for f prime? Interval of convergence for f prime, well, it converged at negative 1, but it diverged at 1. Okay, so you can see what happened here. The original series had an interval of convergence containing both endpoints, but after I took the derivative, what did that do? But after I took the derivative, I actually lost one of the endpoints. I lost the right endpoint. One was in the interval of convergence to begin with, but when I took the derivative, I lost it. I will say as a general rule that it's often common to lose endpoints if you had them to begin with when you're taking derivatives. And on the flip side, when you're taking the antiderivative, it's sometimes common to gain endpoints when you didn't have them to start with. Okay, we'll put a stop right there, and then we'll continue with video two with a bunch of examples about how to
actually apply these various techniques to build power series and determine intervals of convergence for a particular infinite series and power series. So let's stop there and we'll have the second video next time.